This is Kings of Winter Part 2. Last video we talked about the Starks taking control of the North, ending with the Boltons bending the knee as the first Andals began their invasion on Westeros. This video we're going to talk about the Kings of Winter, mostly from the time of the Andal invasion some 6,000 years before a modern A Song of Ice and Fire time, and stop at the last King of Winter, around 300 years before modern A Song of Ice and Fire time. Since there aren't a lot of solid dates, this is pieced together as best as possible. So even with the North now under the Starks' control, they would still have their share of conflicts. The region was protected in the North by the Wall and the Night's Watch, who dealt with any wildling incursions, and the Swamps of the Neck and Moat Kalen served as a defensive wall against any attackers from the South. However, the West and East Coast were vulnerable. On their West Coast, the Starks would have to deal with Reaving of the Ironborn, and on their East Coast, the Andal invasion that was just beginning. Also, a future dispute over the Three Sisters with the Vale would occur along with rebellions within the Starks' territory. Lastly, we'll talk about the Starks versus the Kings Beyond the Wall. Let's start with the Ironborn and the West Coast. The Iron Islands had, and have, a habit of reaving, and the North's coast have been victim to these reavers. There's a lot of history when it comes to the pillaging and attacks by the Ironborn, which began way before the Andals ever arrived. Bear Island, Sea Dragon Point, Cape Kraken, and large portions of the Stony Shore have been raided and held by the Ironborn many times. So many times that maesters believe the populace in those locations may be closer in blood to the Ironborn than the Northmen. During the reign of King Theon Stark, who most likely came to power before the Andal invasion, but definitely was in power during the Andal invasion, the Iron Islands would hit the North's west coast hard once again. Under the leadership of Herrick Hor, longships from Great Wick, Old Wick, Pike, and Orkmont attacked the west coast. During the raids under Herrick, the Ironborn burned entire areas of the Wolf's Wood to nothing but ash, and Herrick's son, Ravos the Raper, took Bear Island as his base for reaving. Eventually, Cape Kraken was taken, and the Stony Shore would be forced to swear fealty to the Iron Islands after these attacks. However, the Iron Men's hold on the West Coast wouldn't last for long. Theon Stark would successfully drive these Ironborn from Cape Kraken, Bear Island, and the West Coast during his reign. The Stark King even killed Herrick's son, Ravos. Years later, Herrick Hor's grandson, Eric the Eagle, under the old Kraken, Loran Greyjoy, would retake Bear Island and Cape Kraken. When the old Kraken died, another King of Winter, King Roderick Stark, would reclaim Bear Island, and if the stories in the North are true, he won Bear Island not through war, but by winning a wrestling match. Roderick Stark's sons and grandsons would continue the battle for Cape Kraken, and about the time Roderick's grandsons reclaimed Kraken Point is when the wars between the North and Ironborn became less decisive, with the North mostly maintaining control of their area. The West Coast would fall under attack by the Ironborn from time to time, but at this point, the Starks always managed to maintain or quickly regain control. This would be the same story with any rebellions that occurred within the Norse borders or wildling attacks in the north. The Starks were quick to put down the rebellions, such as the rebellion in the Rills that King Theon Stark stomped down and the wildlings beyond the wall that Theon led an incursion against, breaking the wildling power for an entire generation. Skagos would also vex the Starks from time to time, but they would always quiet back down. Even when the Boltons rebelled, repeatedly, the kings of the north put them back on their knees. In one rebellion, House Greystark, an offshoot branch of House Stark that was given the honor of maintaining and guarding the Wolf's Den, joined with the Boltons. In the end, the Boltons rebent the knee and the Greystarks were wiped out. With the destruction of the Greystarks, the Wolf's Den would then pass to different houses to maintain, but it would continue to be a weak spot for attacks. Now let's talk about the Andals coming to Westeros. Around the time Theon Stark ruled as the King of the North, a new threat emerged, the Andals. The Andals are viewed as the greatest threat to House Stark, but the Starks and their bannermen always manage to drive them back to the sea. Maesters state that the Swamps of the Neck and Moat Kalen is one of the greatest, if not the only true reason, that the Andals didn't take the North. Not from lack of trying either, as they believe a countless number of Andals died in the Swamps. But the Andals also attacked the North's shores, and King Theon Stark was said to turn back the greatest of these threats. Theon even joined with the Boltons, who had recently been conquered by the Starks, and going after the Andal warlord Argo Sevenstar. After killing Sevenstar at the Battle of the Weeping Water, King Theon Stark raised a fleet and crossed the narrow sea to the shores of Andalos, with Argos's corpse lashed to the prow of his flagship. From there, he burned dozens of villages, captured a fortified sept and three tower houses, and put hundreds to the sword. He then took the heads of the slain as prizes, took them back to Westeros, and planted them on spikes along his coast as a warning to others. Good times. Despite Despite Theon Stark's warning to the Andal invaders, with his very nice decor of severed heads, the North wasn't free from their threat, and they would have to continually guard their lands from further attacks, but they started to mostly come from the South. 
So everything is going great from here. The Starks mostly have control of the Ironborn Reaving, the Wildlings are being held back by the Wall and Night's Watch, and the Andals are kept out of the North. And then the Starks decide, hey, we should rule the Three Sisters. Which isn't surprising since whoever holds the Three Sisters holds the Bite. It's important to note that at this time the Andals had managed to spread throughout Westeros south of the Neck, including taking control of the Vale under the Andal House Aaron. It's also important to know the Three Sisters weren't under the control of the Vale at this time, but by many cruel pirates, raiders, and kings. These rulers of the Sisters would reeve and plunder the Bight, Shivering Sea, and Narrow Sea, and return to the Sisters with their booty. When the Starks finally decided they wanted to control the Sisters, their conquest was named the Rape of the Three Sisters. And depending on who you talk talk to, the Vale's history book tells a very different story than the Norse. In the North, the books basically say this about their attempt at taking the sisters. When the Starks attempted to conquer the three sisters, the sister men went to the King of the Mountain and Vale in the Eyrie for help. The current king, Mathos Aaron, second of his name, provided aid with the condition of sister men then swearing fealty to the Eyrie to rule over. The King of the Vale also said a particularly nasty remark about rather having a pirate than a wolf for a neighbor. Pretty rude. A thousand years of war then occurred between the North and the Eyrie over the rule of the sisters, until the Starks lost interest and allowed the Eyrie to rule over the sisters. Now, here is the Eyrie version of the War for the Three Sisters. When the North came for the Three Sisters, they were brutal. Wild Northmen would kill children to fill their cooking pots. Northern soldiers would draw out the entrails from living men to wind them around spits. Three thousand warriors were executed in a single day at Headman's Mount by those savage Northmen, and Balthasar Bolton's pink pavilion was made from the flayed skins of a hundred sistermen. Finally, the brave king Mathos Aaron heard the cry of the sistermen and agreed to help them, but only if they then allowed the Aaron to ever guard after them from any threat. For a thousand years, the Vale fought bravely for the Three Sisters. Some even dubbed it the Worthless War. The islands would change leadership more than a dozen times, and three times the Northmen would land on the fingers. As the war went on, the Aarons would bravely send a fleet up the White Knife to burn the Wolf's Den, and the Starks savagely replied by attacking Gulltown and burning hundreds of ships when the walls were too strong to breach. But in the end, the Vale was victorious and now protects the Three Sisters. Whether you think the Starks went crazy and started cooking children is up to you, but an Archmaester says that it really wasn't a case of the Eyrie winning, so much as Winterfell losing interest. He says, For ten long centuries, the direwolf and the falcon had fought and bled over three rocks, until one day the wolf awoke as from a dream and realized it was only stone between his teeth, whence he spat it out and walked away. Regardless of what version of the story you believe, it boils down to this. The Starks thought having the three sisters was a good idea, the Aarons opposed them, the Starks and the Aarons fought for a thousand years, and then the Starks finally went, meh, I'll just go over here, this is boring. Lastly, let's talk about the Starks versus the Kings Beyond the Wall before the Targaryens came. Between the time the Andals came and Aegon conquered Westeros, there would be only four known Kings Beyond the Wall. The brothers Gendel and Gorn, the Horn Lord, and maybe Bale the Bard. Gendel and Gorn were brothers who were joint kings around 3,000 years ago. They used a twisting maze of subterranean caverns to pass beneath the wall on scene. They then attacked the Northmen, with Gorn managing to slay the Stark King in battle, but the King's heir in turn slain Gorn. After his brother was killed, Gendel retreated with the remaining wildlings back to the caverns, never to be seen again. Next, the Horn Lord took the title of King Beyond the Wall 1-2,000 to 2, years after the brothers. Though his true name is unknown, it is said he used sorcery to pass the wall, but failed to take the north. Lastly, centuries later, Bale the Bard became the next king beyond the wall. There's debate on whether he existed before or after the Targaryens conquered Westeros, but I'm clumping him into this video. Tales claim Bale the Bard went to Winterfell, took and impregnated the daughter of the king or lord of Winterfell, and returned her with his child. That child became the lord or king of Winterfell, and when Bale became the king beyond the wall and attacked the north, Bale was killed by his own son. If you love the kings beyond the wall, don't worry, they will be analyzed more in depth in a later video. The Starks had ruled for 8,000 years at this point, keeping their shores safe, pushing back the wildlings, and quelling rebellions as they sprang up, but finally they met a challenge even the mighty North couldn't defeat. About 300 years before modern A Song of Ice and Fire time, Aegon Targaryen and his two sister wives would land on the shores of Westeros and forever change the Seven Kingdoms. This is when the line of Kings of Winter would end. Come back next Sunday for the last King of Winter and the North under Targaryen rule, and Wednesday for a short Game of Thrones A Song of Ice and Fire video. If you're a Star Wars fan, a series of videos start soon, and a fall schedule update video will be released next week, which includes my Game of Thrones project. Giveaway winner is announced this Wednesday.